three. Was he elected in 60 or 61? He was elected in 60, but at that time, the inauguration, you know, the right. inauguration didn't happen until March. In 61, right. So, yes. gotcha. so there's a long period for yeah. doing all kinds of things, uh, which went on all the way to FDR. I don't know exactly when it changed, but I think it changed after that. Um, well, I know it changed after that because he was also inaugurated on March 4th. Mm -hmm. I think his last one was January for FDR. No, he was, his, no, his inaugural address, oh, his last his, term. His fourth, his fourth oh, term. right, his fourth yeah, term. His, right, right. Okay, so this is your first section. Um, important development happens in the world after that the New York banks suspend uh, it's specie payment, which means they no longer give you gold for your bonds, for your government bonds. Then in, in 1862, it is a whirlwind, which you will see um, on the economic policies. The uh, tender, some action on slavery, the Agriculture Department, the Homestead Act, the Railroad, and the College Act. All of those in a matter of less than six months. So it's a guy in a hurry, you know, for reasons we can discuss. And I couldn't even get all of 1862 on one page. So <laughs> here we go. I put in the letter to Greeley because that is in such a major uh, discussion point about Lincoln. Uh, but it's very interesting to me that the decision, that Lincoln had already made the decision, which we will discuss, I have a fascinating story about that, to do the Emancipation Proclamation when he said that. Mm -hmm. um, so you have, well, or when he wrote that in a letter, so then you've got uh, more action in 63, heavily on the question of slavery, less on economics, because we're carrying out what was done in the first, in 1862. 1964, uh, dominated, of course, by the reelection campaign and the war. And 1865, the 13th Amendment, Freedmen's Bureau, and assassination. So that gives you an idea of the sweep of this very intense four and something years. So first, let's go with Lincoln's view of the conflict. In other words, the war. Uh, he was absolutely uh, determined that it be called the rebellion, not secession, not civil war, the rebellion. And we that is worth a lot of discussion, probably more than we will do today. But so his inauguration, of course, you know, there was all this threat of assassination and so forth, which had to be dealt with before the inauguration. But, you know, the inaugural address is extensive. Uh, that's something someone could decide to read if they want. I'll give you the two major sources on which you can find everything that we discuss. Uh, the, so the, his view was that the Constitution was made to be perpetual, and it was made, therefore, that you could not, did not have a right to dissolve it. Um, he considered the fact that you would have people would attempt to pull out of the of the country, pull out of the Constitution, to be a um, to be illegitimate and to be a tyrannical act, in fact, against democracy, because 
uh, it was a minority dictating to the majority. He says that over again. Um, this phrase down here I find interesting um, that, of course, the preamble says we're striving for a more perfect union. Right? He said, well, if, if we were striving for a more perfect union, we shouldn't go to a less perfect union. And that's what is being uh, carried out by the secession, by the rebellion. Um, the central idea of secession is the essence of anarchy. One sec, but then he hones in on the slavery issue from the very beginning. One section believes it is right and ought to be extended, while the other believes it is wrong and ought not to be extended. That is the only substantial dispute. Um, and then the part that I've always heard the most, I don't know if you have, in my upbringing and study. I am loath to close. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. And he appeals to the tradition of the revolution, the declaration and the constitution founding. At that point, we were brought together. Those were the, idea, those were the ideas that held us together. Later on, there's a speech that he gives uh, I believe in 1863, where he talks, which is called the Electric Chord Speech. Anybody familiar with that? That's a speech where he's attacking the Know Nothing Party that supported some of the economic ideas of the Republican Party, but was mostly totally anti immigrant. So he said, uh, Lincoln said, I I have nothing to do with the Know Nothing Party. Uh, we have millions of people in the United States who were not here at the time of the rebellion, of our revolution. Their connection is through the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. That's the electric cord that holds our country together. That was his view. Um, uh, it's called by some people say he considered those founding documents to be the secular religion of the United States. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of text in these because we're discussing speeches, and I'm not trying to illustrate the speeches. You know, I think we have to grapple with them. All right. So through the just in terms of we're talking about the oh his overall view of the rebellion and why it was had to be suppressed. Um, gave you the original, but in the course of things, he is constantly offering a peace plans. And he is totally convinced that it would be cheaper by, or you know, less costly in life and economy and to the future of the nation if there was some kind of compensated emancipation plan put into effect. Mm -hmm. um, so the, uh, it's offered several times, uh, always contingent on declarations of loyalty to the federal government. And this uh, is Emancipation Day in Washington, D.C., which you may be familiar with um, coming up soon. Okay. Then we get into the economic uh, blitzkrieg, so to speak. Um, Lincoln, as we went through last week, was a devoted disciple of the American system of economics. His major activity prior to becoming president was how do you build the country? His first major national speech on the National Bank, his you know, defense of the tariff, his support of Henry Clay on that, uh, and the Whig Party, and his uh, promotion of internal improvements, what we would call today infrastructure. So railroads, canals, uh, schools, and other things of that sort. So coming into office, of course, he now deals not only with that problem or that 
perspective, but an economic crisis um, uh, brought on not just by the fact that we had to were waging a war, but also by the, and no one suspected the war to go on anywhere near as long as it did. Uh, but the uh, but also the fact that when he became president, the not only had he lost the southern states tariff revenue, which he obviously did, uh, which is the major source of income for the federal government, but he also uh, found an economy which had been battered by a depression in 1857 and had extremely low tariffs um, and was totally dependent upon borrowing um, at the time. So it had, the free banking era, which began when Jackson uh, pulled the plug out from under the second bank of the United States, was, in, was still in full force. There were thousands of currencies. We'll see. One of them, it's sort of cute. <laughs> did, did like each state issue its own? No, no, not just some states did. Mm -hmm. Companies did. Oh my you know, oh, you know, oh, this this dry so, goods store or so this one dollar of GE was as good as two dollars of Coca Cola. Could be. Okay. Yes, they were discounted all over the place. Oh, how chaos. Did, how, did they, chaotic. how did they do mostly bartering? Well, you need five of these and two of them. And oh, no, they had different, you know, chits from different uh, commercial establishments, but somebody had to decide how much it was worth, you know, and it was up to the person whom you were trying to buy from um, how, what they would accept. It was total, it was total. Talk about lack of national unity. I mean, this is the kind of thing that. Hamilton was absolutely determined to deal with when he set up the National Bank. And that's uh, not that there was the same kind of currency that there is under Lincoln, where we go a step further, but there was a a circulating medium that was standard for the country. It could be used for taxes, it could be used for, uh, for expanding investment. So, you know, this is. Just the, this is uh, a money issued by the Delaware Bridge Company right? with a nice lady, you know, and so forth. But that's just one example of uh, the kind of thing. This is from Lambertville, North Carolina. So they had to have a nice, well-dressed lady. Okay. So the first thing that, you know, Lincoln insisted on at before coming in is we've got to have some revenue, increase our revenue here. So we're going to have to increase the tariff, which has been reduced to the lowest level of any of the major countries of, of Europe. So the, uh, that raised the duties significantly, although not as high as it was during the 1820s. Um, and Justin Morrill of Vermont was one of the major uh, allies of Lincoln in the Republican Party. And then he, uh, they begin to issue bonds, more bonds through the New York banks, um, and you know to raise money. Um, and Lincoln calls a special session of Congress. Congress, you know, Congress had a schedule quite different from today. I mean, they had they came in for the inauguration. They were there like four, three weeks or four weeks. Then they were gone. Then he called them back. I mean, it's it's sort of it's hard, very hard to track down when you're doing research as to what uh, the Congress, what the length of various congressional sessions is. But anyway, at the special session, now the war has broken out, which it hadn't at the beginning, uh, and uh, he calls for volunteers. It's not the time of the draft yet. Uh, 400,000 men and $400,000. Uh, and you all can read this, right? So I'm not going to read it unless someone asks me to. You never got anywhere near 400,000 men that would have been. 
the army is about 50,000 people or so. I I really can't tell you, but I can, we can find out. It seems like an awful lot of people. Yes, it is. I think they did get to a lot of people, but mm -hmm. I, I don't know for sure. Thank you. Uh, I told you I haven't studied the war per se, but I should know that, but I don't. Um, so, you know, this, this special session, again, talks about the objective is to is to is to improvement for all that's what he's saying elevate the condition of men well we will hear that again we heard that last time yes i'm always uh, trying to track in my mind the timeline so what what year is this this is uh the summer i'm going in chronological order here. okay this is july of 1861 july of 1861 uh, and the next, you know, they continue to work on uh, funding the government through borrowing um, and trying to wedge the war. There was a major shock, I believe it's the summer of 1861, at the loss of Bull Run, which was a total, you know, which indicated the war was not going to go so quickly. Um, and uh, but things are getting a little bit dicey on the money side, despite the tariff, because the bankers in New York who were uh, very much tied to banking in London are not too happy with this war. They like to continue with, you know, they don't want to offend the cotton tr trade and the, the, uh, the slave system down there, uh, nor really does do the British. I mean, the British, there's a famous quote from, Palm, from Lord Palmerston, the prime minister, who says, you know, we don't like slavery, but we don't like the moral tariff worse. You know, we hate the moral tariff worse uh, because it's preventing us from being the main industrial supplier to the United States. Uh, and they use that as blackmail. Uh, so in his first address, he begins to discuss economic measures from two standpoints. One, well, three standpoints. One is the long view of that has always been his commitment to build the country. The second is the immediate need to raise money uh, for the war. And the third is to strategically address the uh, border states in particular, because you have Tennessee, Kentucky, Missouri, um, all sort of in their slave states, but they don't really want to split from the Union, right? Mm -hmm. So he wants to... Uh, uh, he and K Henry Carey, who is his major economic advisor, uh, are talking about how he could, could solidify and shift them into being fully union states. Uh, and one way would be to just get railroad links into those areas, which mm -hmm. would facilitate expanding commerce on different and a different kind of economy than the slave economy. Uh, mm -hmm. But the thing that really, you know, he, he's really putting a priority on improving the welfare of the working man as well. So at the very end, he says, uh, this is something he had said in his campaigning in, in 1859 as well, at least one time. Uh, you know, I'm not, basically, I'm not out to make the bankers rich, you know, uh, labor is prior to capital, and labor has to benefit from what we're doing, right? That's what uh, labor is a superior of capital. In other words, you would never have gotten capital if people had worked to build things, right? So that was something of a red flag to the bankers in uh, New York. And they actually came down to, to negotiate in uh, uh, Washington 
and say, you know, this is a bad idea. Look, we'll, we'll peddle all the bonds you want, right? But you should really fund this war uh, with increased taxation on your population, on your industries, uh, and you should rely on us and we'll take care of you. And we can sell all these bonds in Europe, right? Now, of course, if they sell the bonds in Europe and the bonds are called in, it depletes the gold supply here in the United States. And it essentially makes the uh, United States dependent again on the European powers who are not particularly friendly. They have not declared one way or another, but they're not particularly friendly to this um, mm -hmm. Uh, turn of events. So, uh, and these are the bankers, two bankers. Uh, I guess Belmont, who eventually becomes the Rothschild agent in the United States, uh, or who was actually under, became that under Jackson. And uh, this guy is named James Gallatin. He's the son of the former Treasury Secretary, Albert Gallatin. Who runs a consortium? He and Oz with Hamilton, the, the father. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Um, and he was at odds with the policy um, of of using federal power to right. develop the country. Um, so these guys are the ones who came down to negotiate, right? And uh, there was a refusal on the part of the I mean, Lincoln, the Republicans controlled the Congress at this time. Um, and no they, ones. Well, no, you had some, you had anti-slave Democrats who were yeah. around all the time. In fact, in, in, the, in the midterm elections, they gained considerably. Mm -hmm. um, although, well, the US is losing the war. So, you know, it, or appears to be losing the war. So that people were fickle in case you hadn't noticed. <laughs> uh, so uh, we want to, you know, go that way. Anyway, so, uh, and the other thing that they wanted to do was uh, to eliminate, uh, the, to have the government not issue currency in its own name, i.e. not just backed by gold, not backed, directly by gold, but by the full faith, of what we've called the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. So that, I told you about the link to gold. And when the administration and Congress refuse the demands of the bankers from New York, they cut off the redemption species of bonds that already they had been given to uh, they had been agents for, for the, for the federal government. And that, of course, was like the declaration of war. So, although Lincoln you know, never dealt with it openly like that, the way FDR did later and say, you know, they hate me and that's fine because I hate them too. But the, uh, this is, uh, uh, a different kind of war. So what Lincoln pro uh, proceeds to do and the Congress proceeds to do is create the greenbacks for the National Currency Act of 1862. And that is not, it, it, they can't be used for everything. Tax tariffs are still paid in, spe in gold, in specie, gold or silver. I didn't realize that until recently, but, but greenbacks could be used for taxes, sort of like the old Bank of the United States script could be used in taxes for paying the troops and for aid of Congress. People, you know, the economic experts and opponents all thought this would be a disaster. No one would accept it. It wasn't true. It was seen as a patriotic act to create um, this new currency. Who was that picture on the, on the side there? I think that's Hamilton. I, I mean, was wondering if he, was. It, there was a greenback with Hamilton's okay. picture on it. Uh, that I think is one of, one of the ones. 
It probably says who it is at the top, but I can yeah, find it very hard to read these, yeah. this script. Anyway, I better move along here. Because... Now, so after he, so they set up the greenbacks, it starts with 150 million increases. Uh, there's a loophole in it that says the interest is paid in bold by the government, but not, it's not, not the whole money is paid in bold. So the, uh, but then he proceeds, you know, this is in April, I believe, wanting to know the date, um, no, in May, uh, the Department of Agriculture. Agriculture, very dear to, to Lincoln's heart, obviously critical for the war. He wants to see it upgraded technologically. We talked about this in 1859, about steam tractors, right? Could we have steam tractors? So he is a major push on improving the productivity and therefore lessening the amount of physical labor and increasing uh, the living standard. The Homestead Act, that was in May. This was not uh, proposed by Lincoln, but it was a, a party thing. Um, and it was obviously extremely popular with many people who wanted to move. Very controversial these days because obviously the land that uh, you know, appeared to be free uh, was contested, to say the least, uh, by the Indian uh, Native Americans who lived there. And there were treaties done in certain places and non-treaties in other places uh, and so forth. Uh, but this significant positive element was you had to improve it, right, in order to keep it. Um, and the terms were extremely lenient to buy it. And it was open to non-citizens. And after, after slavery was eliminated, it was open to free blacks. I mean, it was open to free blacks. It wasn't segregated in that respect wasn't open to, to slaves. Um, and then in July, the Pacific Railroad Act, um, this, of course, as you may know, the uh, idea of a transcontinental railroad had been discussed and thought about for a decade or more, a little more. Uh, they'd been unable to agree on the route when the Southerners weren't there anymore, they were able to agree on the route, although there was actually discussion of not just doing one, but of doing five um, uh, transcontinental railroads. Why? Unity of the country and a massive improvement in uh, a cheapening of transportation costs for your commerce and also uh, improvement of productivity in general. So, this is the economic impact of the railway, uh, the reduction of time of commerce. And it was funded by land grants heavily uh, and government bonds. Um, the railroad companies did pay back those government bonds. Uh, according to everything that I've seen, uh, there was actually ultimately a, a, not only a profit made by the country by its increase in productivity and decrease in waste, but it also uh, financial. And then same, same month, July, the Moral Tariff, um, and the Moral College Act. And this fulfilled Lincoln's concept that education was, which we went through last time with his, when he first announced for political office, he said, there's nothing more important than promoting education for the common man, you can say common man, but ordinary people, I think is what he was to call it. Uh, so this again was money was provided uh, for, from the federal government in the form of 30,000 acres of public land per senator and representative. 
and that was to be sold and the proceeds put into government bonds and the interest on those bonds dedicated to supporting the colleges. And the amazing number of fantastic colleges were actually done. The first one was in Kansas, but the uh, MIT started off as a land grant college. Uh, you know, Cornell. Uh, it didn't start that way. Cornell it only became partially land grant. Yeah, okay. I, that was something I just saw in one of their promos for, for a program. They, yeah. said, they, they said we were a land grant college. The School of Agriculture, Home Ag, and a few others are land grant, the rest of them are private. Mm -hmm. And okay. for students that try to switch from one to the other, mm -hmm. finally have a hell of a bill. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. But MIT was? No, that's what he's saying. Oh, MIT, MIT is. No, no, I call it Cornell. Oh, yeah. Cornell. Cornell. Oh, New York. I don't but know. MIT, MIT went through a, a uh, elaboration as well. Mm -hmm. The ones that are absolutely uh, Texas A&M, uh, University of California, Penn State, Penn State mm -hmm. and so forth. These are all uh, you know, from the beginning of the of Iowa, uh, Kansas, University of Kansas. It's, uh, so this is more provision. This is the detail if and when you get the, e the uh, slideshow. Um, I'm not going to read this. This will give you the details so that you don't have to look up the bill. See, this is a quote from the bill, exactly how the money is supposed to function. And, but, you know, despite the National Currency Act of 1862, things were not, you know, going as smoothly as, uh, and as, as productively as the administration needed. So they worked on updating that with the new National Currency Act in 1863. And this is the one that established a national banking system, the core of which we still have today. It established the, uh, the continued to have the greenbacks that are uh, backed by the full faith and credit of the government, uh, but it's, and it established national regulation of national banks. Right? There were still state banks um, and uh, there had to be a process of creating national banks. And the people who set the standards were the uh, controller of the currency. The, those, the, those standards had some requirements, um, which included purchasing a minimum number of treasury bonds as part of their capitalization. For that, they would get greenbacks to circulate and to use. Um, they, this new agency would regulate the bank. They would set standards, how much you had to have in capital in order to versus how much you would lend. That would tend to be a lot more rigorous than the state banks. Um, and it would carry out supervision in those respects. There was resistance to this. Of course, uh, and it was obviously to the benefit of the federal government because it meant that they would be purchasing bond, uh, bonds, and then that would build up the uh, value of the bonds on the market. So, but uh, eventually, in fact, in order to expand, get enough banks into the national system, uh, the Congress passed a, a 10% tax on uh, bills that were uh, not from the National Bank. And that really got everybody in mind. Now the second aspect of this entire uh, administration is obviously movement toward emancipation. And that, which he of course laid out at the very beginning as slavery being the issue. The first steps, just to give you an overview, 
some of which I find quite interesting. One, that he recognized Haiti and Liberia in December of 1861 in the, that first speech. Uh, the uh, sort of funny, they just recognized Liberia since it was established by US money, but anyway. But Haiti had not been recognized uh, except unofficially uh, by the Adams administration and, and uh, Alexander Hamilton. At the end, it was cut off by Jefferson. So um, the, I had not realized he signed a bill eliminating slavery in all territories in the, the summer. And then this decision on emancipation. Um, there is in a book on leadership by Doris Curtis Goodwin, a fascinating discussion. It's a great book. Fascinating discussion about how he uh, came to this conclusion. Because, of course, it went against his thought of what the Constitution did, which was allow slavery to continue in the southern states. You know, and that was a commitment. But he came to the conclusion that the only way that you could hurt the Confederacy. And this he gleaned, she says, in part by the fact that he went out and met with the common soldiers mm -hmm. and talked to them, that the only way that you could really ensure, could undercut the Confederacy was to take their slaves away so that they would not be helping uh, provide the logistical backup, which the Confederate soldiers needed. And that, that secondly, that it was justified to, uh, to violate this initial agreement of allowing slavery to exist in the southern states if the very existence of the Constitution was at stake. Said, well, it's more important. I mean, you can't, it's like cut off your nose to spite your face, except worse, it's cut off your throat. <laughs> You know, so um, so he was uh, he made these the decision, and then he took it to his cabinet. Uh, he did not. He wanted his cabinet to agree, but he did not. He said, "I've decided this is not." And a painting was actually done for the cabinet meeting in which he presented this. Um, the, was the cabinet uh, that strong? Well, that's the painting he took. Right. I think it may have had a couple more people uh, involved because Stan Seward, Blair, uh, that's the team rivals. And anyway, Bates. Uh, yeah, I think there are more than that. But that's the painting that was done of that. Uh, and he said, you know, tell me what you think. You know, give me your response. I'll take it all into account, but I've decided. Right? <laughs> and this is on July 22nd, which is before the letter to Greeley saying, uh, if I had to keep slavery and uh, to save the union, I would. And then, you know, having gone through that entire process and actually eventually gotten the support of the cabinet. He made a couple changes based on Seward. what Seward had to say. He, he publicly announced that he was going to do it unless, and that, uh, you know, it appeared in all the newspapers on September 22nd, I'm going to do this uh, on January 1st. Uh, there is an unless, right, which he actually uh, lays out in uh, December. But was he calling for colonization? Part of that, I, I missed the last um, couple yes. sentences. He said that he was in favor of colonization, but it was not um, a, uh, a not a requirement. Okay, so it was an open question. It was an open question. He addressed that. I mean, we can discuss that at some other point. I've got more, much more on that. So, 
In fact, I have a little more later to later on this. So this is the bottom line. They should be forever free, and the, and the, government, the military will enforce it. And uh, so that's it for this in 1720, in, uh, on September 22nd. Uh, he elaborates on this uh, in his December 1862 speech to Congress, at which point he actually proposes a compensated emancipation. He says, look, you know, it will, it will benefit us as a nation if we cut this war short. Uh, obviously, at this point, 1863, just uh, no, 1862, you know, things aren't necessarily going that well in terms of the war. Um, everybody's bleeding, you know, pretty badly. And, uh, but in that discussion of the compensated emancipation, he says, everyone's going to disagree with me on this. The radicals will disagree with me. The conservatives will disagree with me. Uh, but he says, but I really, I, and I, I am a colonization man. I mean, I, I, I think that is the only way that the Blacks can have a good life. I mean, that's what one current of the colonization society believed. What does that, that mean? What does colonization mean? It means go to context. Liberia, go so, to a Black, so, uh, it means to go to a, okay. a Black run country gotcha. or a territory set aside in the United States that would be run by so that was his original idea that would be the best. He didn't intend, he didn't believe that the best idea would be this total. I don't, very few people believe that, that it was possible yeah. at this point to have a, they, they were fearful that once slavery was ended, that the rage, you know, of, and revenge would yeah. make it impossible. They also had seen discrimination of an incredibly, you know, brutal sort of free Blacks that did exist because the number of free Blacks had increased, you know, a great deal since the beginning of the uh, country. Right. And, uh, and it wasn't a pretty picture, right, in terms of the way they were treated. So the guy who first started the colonization society, that was his thing, right? So, and it was a very small minority who thought it would be possible to, to have a mixed society, a diverse society as, as we believe today. Was, was that his, his uh, part of his reason for recognizing Liberia and Haiti? No, I oh. think it was because he thought they were legitimate republics was in favor of republics. Hmm. I mean, maybe, maybe there's an aspect of that, but I, I don't think that was a major source because he was not totally committed to, you know, pushing the colonization. And he was, uh, and as, as he argues in here, it's highly interesting. He addresses those who say, Blacks can't stay in the country because it'll hurt the white working class. He says that's not true. Now that, you know, was one of the major arguments that people used to excuse their racist attitude toward this. You know, they said, you know, uh, and, you know, there was a certain amount of evidence that when you had slavery, it reduced the wage, wage rate. Right. So, but they, but that's under slavery. If, if they're freed, he said, well, he goes through a whole argument. And those who have you, well, Bruce, who's reading the 1862, will get it. Master it. But I'm going to get through the rest of this talk. So, <laughs> um, and then you have. Now, of course, that's not accepted. You know, his proposal for gradual emancipation, expressing loyalty to the national government and so forth. I mean, he didn't offer a lot of anywhere near as much money as the British did, I think. I mean, their emancipation was all compensated. 
Uh, it was $300 a person or something like that. They all have fewer too. Well, direct. Yeah. They had a, a lot more international uh, in India. Um, which, by the way, they they made an exception when they freed them, when they declared men to slavery in 1833. They said another 10 years for India. <laughs> so um, the uh, so keep in mind, having announced this intent, there was tremendous ripple effects, particularly in the black population, but not only, you know, uh, there were negative, and there, you know, people were saying there'll be an explosion in the army, we'll never be able to keep the army together and so forth. And, but the black population was extremely excited about the fact that you had a date certain that there was going to be emancipation, even though it was only in the Southern states, that was a hell of a lot of slaves. So, um, there were watch parties the whole night before they would stay up to, to wait for it. And he didn't do it until, it didn't come over the wires till 10 o'clock in the, in the evening oh, on dear. January 1st. I don't know, he had a big reception at the, at the White House and was shaking hands and this and that matter. And people kept waiting, you know, when's it gonna come? When's it gonna come? But he did it. Well, they were all hung up. Well. <laughs> He, he was, uh, no, no, he was exhausted because he had been shaking hands all day. The story is that he, his hand was shaking because he, it was, you know, he used it so much and he actually stopped and said, I have to wait. I don't want my hand to, I don't want my signature on this to be shaky. I want my signature on this to be firm. And he was convinced by everything that, uh, that he said to people later um, that this was this was his signature act for history. This was his uh, legacy. And what he added to the declaration, uh, the proclamation, which was not in, in September, was to call for black truth, a, a call to enlist the freedmen into the army. And that, you know, uh, people were very trepidatious about. It. Um, but it but it worked. It worked. And it, you know, Frederick Douglass, who had an off and on uh, relationship with Lincoln uh, at the beginning, but ultimately was a close ally of his, uh, you know, really picked up on it and gave speeches and became a major recruiter. Uh, actually, I didn't point out in that other celebration in South Carolina, there was already, there were already black volunteers in military units working before that. But this is, uh, so this, uh, I mean, his relationship, he met with Lincoln three times. Uh, not before the Emancipation Proclamation, it was after it was, uh, but he very much, uh, his last time was after the second inaugural, which he thought was absolutely phenomenal. Um, and uh, and he's, well, we'll discuss that when we talk about the legacy, because of course there was a lot of of antagonism that had that he personally experienced for working with women uh, and uh, and a lot of upset that he had about the inequalities of what was going on. Um, then you had plans to forge the peace. Now, you know, part of that involved the slavery issue, but part of it involved dealing with the fact that you had the destruction of the war and you had the enmity which existed because of the uh, fighting over all these years. So the general plan, like in that 1861 first speech, was move industrialization into the South, right, which had been resisted 
uh, heavily by the major uh, plantation uh, oligarchs there. I mean, it had begun to pick up a bit uh, the desire to industrialize in the 1850s when it became clear that there might be a separation and that they were dependent upon Northern industry and therefore maybe should have some themselves. Uh, but Harry's idea was industrialize this middle area, get the mines open, like, you know, get the, get some production and involvement in actual uh, industrial activity going in the center. And he, you know, Kerry saw the problem with that being in both the North and the South, because they were looking for the South was looking for continuing their market with British, with the British on the cotton, which he took 80% of the cotton. Um, and the those who made their living by shipping, you know, wanted to see that continue uh, and make their money like that. And they so they were also effectively uh, making up to the British. And he saw it as he actually as late as 18. Very late, even after the war, he said, our, the way our economy is working is basically still colonized by the British mm -hmm. because we haven't really broken through to being a self uh, moving industrial economy. And this whole, there's a fascinating piece by Kerry, who is who's Lincoln's economic advisor, but he's also very much a political organizer in this period in the Republican Party trying to get through, defend the programs that were carried out in 1862, defend the tariff, defend the greenbacks, defend the, uh, and promote the, the infrastructure uh, thrust. And he links that, he had actually done it back in 1853, but he links it to the fact that this is freedom, right? That freedom will come as you raise the wages and the living standards of your population in these Southern areas, which was abysmal. I mean, the situation of the whites, white population here was very, very bad uh, in most places. So this is, gives you an idea of what he thought should have happened. And from that, you can see what he wanted the administration to carry out in order to uh, fill, the, fill the country with factories and, and mines, and, you know, and productive activity and schools. He didn't say that there, but that's another thing. Now, uh, you're dealing here with uh, 1863, and that's a war year, big war year. Uh, we're not going through that, but, you know, Gettysburg and Vicksburg in, the, in July. Um, so things are beginning to turn. A certain amount, it begins to be uh, fairly increasingly clear that that the uh, North with its superior manpower and industrial might uh, will probably eventually uh, prevail. And uh, leaving in the course of that, there's, there's the dedication of the Gettysburg uh, Cemetery. Um, and I just included the whole speech, but we're not gonna go through that. See how short it is, that's what, <laughs> amazingly short. Uh, yeah. uh, he, he wasn't the main speaker. Uh, main speaker spoke so long, it must just be longer than I'm speaking. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, I'll, I'll hurry up. Uh, so, uh, and then again, he offers another plan, right, uh, to try to reconcile the country together. I mean, he really is aware of how are we, I mean, how are we going to pull people back together again? How are we going to find the links that 
that will allow us the nation to heal. Um, and that is, so he issues this plan for an amnesty and the construction of December 8th. Uh, you know, I, once again, it's attack from all sides uh, as being too lenient uh, mm -hmm. on the, the particular state that was at issue was Louisiana, but uh, because they had already met some of these qualifications. But Lincoln said, you know, I think this is the way to go and uh, they're making certain steps. And, you know, but of course, Congress has the power to decide whether to accept the representatives because that's what the constitution says. He wasn't attempting to override that. And then there's the uh, 13th Amendment uh, fight, which begins in the December of 1863. It's not passed until 1865. Uh, it begins with this guy from Ohio. He was a, a uh, um, I mean, in collaboration with Lincoln, but uh, he was a uh, someone on the railroad. Liberation Railroad. No, oh, anyway, uh, and then a similar one in the Senate, a guy from Missouri, of all people. Now, the language of that amendment is so very controversial today, given the separate punishment of the crime. That comes from the Northwest Ordinance, by the way. That was not a new, uh, new development. It sort of comes from British law, I think, uh, but British common law. Um, but the, uh, there was an alternative introduced from Massachusetts, which basically just said, you know, all men are created equal or something. I mean, it was a, something that didn't have that exception in it. Um, but uh, that was seen as that it wouldn't pass. Um, and in fact, it, this didn't pass the House for another almost two years. Um, it passed the Senate in, uh, in April, but it was stuck in the House. And, and that's without the Southern states, right? Uh, so it's with the, the anti-slave Democrats and so forth and so on, um, who had gained considerably more power uh, because of the war problems and everything in the midterm elections. So it was, so, you know, the political situation in terms of parties was very dicey. Lincoln was convinced he would not be reelected. Um, and, uh, but he was renominated and the platform did include the 13th Amendment, which is good. And he wins. It's uh, you know partly that very helped by the military victories in the South, but you know the, the surprising thing to everybody was that uh, he won all that in the military. I mean, McClellan was absolutely convinced, and so was the Democratic Party, that the McClellan, the, having been a very popular general, that he would have swept the military. That didn't happen. I mean, Lincoln had created a personal relationship in with the with many, many, many of the men. His office was open to people to come in and complain and come and make uh, pleas for help and so forth and so on. Uh, uh, and while this, you know. Uh, is going on uh, while the election campaign is going on and the war is sort of grinding, it appears to be grinding toward victory. Uh, the economic fight is intensifies actually uh, because with the power of these Democrats and with certain appointments into the, into the administration where the people who are Say they're for one thing and then turn out for something else. Have we ever heard of that? Heard of that before? Um, 
there is a tendency to want to say, well, the war is going down, so that now we'll reduce the tariff, and now we'll reduce the greenbacks, we'll cut back the currency, you know, uh, and so forth. And Kerry says no. Um, and he did this. People believe that Lincoln requested that he do this. Um, but of course, one of the major things that Lincoln was determined, I think that the movie Lincoln is correct on that, was that he get this legislation passed into the country for emancipation in the Constitution itself. Uh, and that is in January of 1861. As you can see, there's pandemonium in the House of Representatives. And to begin to move on that, the Freedmen Bureau was established. Freedmen's Bureau is established by Congress. Congress now is much more powerfully Republican um, uh, and dominated heavily by what's called the Radical Republicans, uh, who are totally committed to the Kerry economic program uh, and uh, defense of emancipation. And this is the mandate of the Bureau, uh, which is to, uh, to include a lot of schools, um, physical sustenance. I think what's mostly discussed today is the contracts between freedmen and employers, which obviously uh, in light of today's practice and so forth, being a lot to be desired, but the, uh, this is, and that Freedmen's Bureau did help establish a great number of, uh, was headed by Oliver Howard, the general, and was very much uh, moved toward educational institutions. And then you have the second inaugural, which is, this is not the whole second inaugural, but it's almost the whole second inaugural <laughs> because it was also extremely short. Uh, he said, he speeds off by saying, well, you know, this is the second time I'm doing this, so I don't know that I need to say a whole lot, but let me say, and then he concentrates on how are we going to build, how are we going to bring the nation together? That's the problem. He was he was absolutely, uh, he was happy, obviously, uh, to the extent that it looked like the war was about to end. But, you know, this is in March. The war has not ended yet. Right? And he, but he is extremely worried about how are you going to get national unity? How are you going to get people to come together? And then after the victory, there's his final speech. This is uh, a speech which everyone thought would be a jubilant cry of victory, but it's not. It is also totally angst ridden, I would say, about how we're going to pull the country together. Um, I'm very aware of the differences between those who want revenge, those who want super lenient to just go back to effectively the same system before and a different name and so forth. The crucial quote, which scholars seem to agree was what uh, was a trigger. I don't think, I think the plot to kill him was undoubtedly there beforehand, but the thing that emotionally uh, really hit John Wilkes Booth was the idea of the vote for uh, the black people. Uh, and some of them looks like and the very intelligent. And soldiers. Yes. Yeah. All soldiers. Yeah. And there were what? There were soldiers. There were a lot of soldiers. Mm -hmm. I forget. I'll look it up again. I I, I looked it up. But... Okay, and then assassination five days later um, where uh, he 
This is one of the famous pictures of his deathbed. And now it belongs to the religious. By the way, the 100th anniversary of that memorial is coming up on the 22nd of May. There's going to be a big mm -hmm. celebration. Mm -hmm. And that is my calling card. 